Everyone is so nice and quiet. I haven't gotten any negative signs, so I guess we're on the air. Uh, welcome to everyone that's here. It's wonderful to see everyone bright and early in relative terms. And yes, and uh, greetings to all those who are joining us online. We're glad we have that technology. This is a morning worship service here at the Church of Christ that meets in shirts. Uh, thankfully, we have the wherewithal to to enjoy this comfortable building. We live in a place of the world where we can meet and worship our Lord and God, the one true and living God, without any fear of interference. We pray it will ever be so, but we also pray that we will continue to have the faith and purpose in heart to worship as we desire and as we are commanded, no matter what happens. Thank you to our visitors especially. If you are a first or second time visitor, we would greatly appreciate you filling out one of the visitor information cards located in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, maybe sometime during the service, uh, if you would like, you can leave it with one of us or perhaps place it in the collection plate in the foyer as you leave this morning. But you are our honored guest. We're glad that you're here. If you have any questions of any of us regarding what you see and hear during the sermon or the service today, uh, please let us know. We'd love to talk to you about it and uh, invite you back at any opportunity. We do have several announcements to make later on in the service. Our dear brother Stan Stockton is leading our singing this morning. We'll go into our first song after our opening prayer. If you would please, let's pray together. Our holy and righteous Heavenly Father, we acknowledge you as the one true and living God, the creator and sustainer of us all a power that is beyond comprehension, yet an all-holy and loving and merciful being that is willing to know each one of us by name on a personal level and desires nothing more than for us to submit ourselves in accordance with your will so that we can be counted as one of your children and you our Father and so that we through the righteous life here to the best of our ability during our time in this mortal coil oh so short that we will have been found faithful and be able to spend an eternity with you in your presence, which also is beyond our ability to comprehend. But we know in your word and the faith that it creates in us that these things are true. And we praise your name for it. Thank you that you knew that even though we would be flawed, even though we were created perfectly, it was all very good that the devil would come in, he would do his best to undermine everything that you had created in a pristine state. Yet because you knew these things were true, that before you ever created anything, that you and your precious son had in mind the sacrifice that it would take of Jesus to allow us through contact with his blood to to be redeemed. Father, help us to live every day of our lives with that truth in mind so that we never stray far from you. Thank you that you're willing to forgive us when we do if we but repent and turn back to you. With those things in mind, Father, help us to enter into this worship service with the bright heart to sing praises from the depth of our spirit 
to listen attentively as the bread of life is shared and to examine ourselves as we later in this service partake of the Lord's Supper. The emblem said, help us remember what Jesus did for us. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. If you would, first of all, mark your songbooks uh, at number 714. This is our invitation song after the lesson. 714. And before our scripture reading and our lesson, we'll sing the first two verses of number 690. And notice there's a time signature change in this when you get to the chorus. So just pay attention. We know this song. Mm -hmm. Careless soul, why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation? Oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment, unprepared to meet thy God. Why so thoughtless are you standing while the fleeting years go by and your life is spent in folly, oh, prepare to meet thy God. Oh, prepare, oh, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment, unprepared to meet thy God. Good morning. May you please grab your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 6. Again, that is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 in the New King James Version. <clears throat> I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. It is indeed good to see all of you this morning. Glad that you are here, the ones we can see, and we're grateful for the participation of those we can't see. These are strange times, but it seems like we're kind of getting adjusted, and things are beginning to change for the better, and we're grateful for that. Sometimes we hear strange conversations. A dining table, a husband and a wife sitting there, he said, our adjustable rate mortgage went up last year. We paid hundreds more in interest. She said, that's terrific. 
He said, we made some, we sold some investments last year. We made a nice profit. She said, that's awful. She said, everyone was sick last year. We did not have any insurance. We had a lot of doctor's bills. The husband replied, that's great. She said, our oldest daughter had graduated last year. She got a good job. Now she's on her own. The husband said, oh, I'd forgotten about that. That's terrible. Now, a person overhearing this conversation might wonder about these people. What's the expression? We wonder if they're a couple of bales short of a load. Maybe in this part of Texas, Texas you would say they had some loco weeds in their weeds. <laughs> they seem to have a strange view of life. They have a very strange view, at least, of their financial life. And we may not have a very favorable impressions of this person, this couple's intellectual capacity until we realize what they're doing. What are they doing? They're preparing their income tax. April the 15th is a strange day. A lot of things, a lot of financial things in particular are exactly backwards. The pluses become minuses, the minuses become pluses, more income, that's more taxes to pay. More interest paid, that's a bigger deduction. Doctor bill, another deduction. A child going out on their own and getting a good job, that's a loss of an exemption. On that strange day, there is a different value scheme applied many times than there is during the rest of the year. Those who have not thought about that, <laughs> they may be in for some unpleasant surprises. During the year, if we have made all of our financial investments, all of our financial decisions based only on the short term of that year, April 15th may wind up being a day of disappointment to us. A day of reversals of our financial fortunes. Well, today is March the 14th. One month from now, Lord willing, we will progress to April the 14th. And April the 14th is a significant day to many people because it's the day before tax day. I just want to mention, if you don't mind a personal note, April the 14th, 2021, in a month from now, is going to be a particularly significant day to me. Because it was on April the 14th, 25 years ago, in 1996, that I preached my first sermon for the Butical Church of Christ. You can't imagine how difficult it is for me to comprehend that I had been preaching for 25 years. Before that, I was in secular work in Washington, D.C. for 18 years, and when I made the decision to become a preacher, I wondered if God would be gracious enough to me to allow me to preach for as many years as I'd been in secular work. Well, he's been much more gracious than that. 18 years in secular work hardly compares to 25 years as a preacher. And uh, those of you who have probably already heard me talk about that, you know I am very, very grateful for that. And on that Sunday in 1996, one month shy of 25 years ago, the sermon that I preached, one of the sermons that I preached on my first Sunday as a preacher, is this sermon about income tax day. I preached it on Sunday night. Why did I preach that particular sermon? Well, it was right before tax day. But I preached it because I remembered hearing it when I was a little boy, about 10 or 12 years old. So when I realized I was going to be starting my preaching career essentially on tax day, I wrote to the preacher who I'd heard preach that sermon almost 40 years earlier. He was the person who taught me. He was the person who baptized me. He was the first preacher that I heard in his lessons and his Bible classes. So I wrote him and said, I remembered this particular sermon. And when I realized I was going to be starting my career on tax day, I thought, that might be a good one to start out with. It's very topical. Well, I wrote him. As you can imagine, he was pleased that a little kid had remembered a sermon that he had preached almost 40 years earlier. I asked him to send me his notes on that sermon, and he did and the notes on a few other sermons. He was pleased that somebody that long ago had remembered. Now, why did I remember that sermon? What did I remember about that sermon? What I remembered about that sermon was the main point. The main point is just as people have sometimes a severe reversal in their financial fortunes on income tax day, sadly, many people are going to have a similar reversal on the judgment day. On Judgment Day, there is going to be a different standard applied to our lives than perhaps we've been applying for the rest of our lives. 
God's going to apply his set of principles. His set of principles are very different than the earthly principles that were judged by while we're here on this earth. And he has not kept that a secret. He has told us about that in the scriptures. He's warned us about that. In fact, maybe we notice sometimes that there are statements in the scriptures. I'll give you an example by Jesus. Statements that sound just as strange as the statements that were being made by that couple around the dinner table while they were preparing their income tax. For example, Matthew 10, 39, Jesus said, He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Strange reversal of fortunes. In fact, I would suggest to you that one of Jesus' best-known accounts, one of the best-known stories, is of just exactly that kind of reversal of fortune. It's found in Luke 16. It's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The story begins really with two people's conditions as the earth, in earthly values they would be evaluated. Luke 16, 19, and 20, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate. That's how the people would have evaluated their condition based on earthly standards. But when God applied his evaluation scheme, his spiritual, eternal evaluation scheme, how different were their circumstances? Verses 22 and 23, So it was that the beggar died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort, a place of reward. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes. Being a beggar, <laughs> evolved into having comfort in Abraham's bosom. Being a rich man evolved into torments. And as I thought about that, I, I think it's virtually impossible to imagine a more dramatic change in circumstances than the one we have in this story. And that kind of reversal of fortune, the rich man and Lazarus, that's not an isolated teaching by Jesus. It seems that's one of the main themes in his teachings. For example, Luke chapter 6 beginning in 24, But woe unto you who are rich, for you've received your consolation. Woe unto you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to their prophets before. Dramatic changes in fortunes. And in this set of scriptures, especially verse 25, I think it's one of the key words for understanding this. Verse 25 talks about now. This is the contrast between now and later. And what a dramatic contrast it is. Those who are full now are going to hunger later. Those who laugh now are going to warm, mourn and weep later. Those who enjoy the acclaim of men now, well, it's not going to be so well later. You see the problem? The problem is applying a short-term evaluation scheme to make the, all our decisions in this life. When there's going to be a very different evaluation scheme applied for eternity. What the couple doing their income taxes and the examples from Jesus' teaching, what they had in common is just that. People who had made decisions based on a short-term evaluation scheme were beginning to realize how different things were going to be when a different evaluation scheme was applied. Those who do not consider the long-term implications of short-term decisions, they may be in for some nasty surprises in their financial conditions, maybe in their eternal conditions. The ability to look ahead. The ability to look ahead is extremely important. It's a mark of maturity. Children live for the moment. I've told the story. But I told the story for years, and then I found out I think there's an actually a, a psychological experiment that showed the same thing. A child would much rather have one piece of candy today than a promise of ten pieces of candy for tomorrow. As they mature, they change. We hope they change. Sometimes we see people around us are, have gotten older, but they've not matured. They haven't changed. Hopefully they develop eventually the understanding that if they want to be successful in the future, they must think ahead. Sometimes they have to give up some things today to have a better tomorrow. 
So young people, young people of all ages, if you want a measuring stick to measure your maturity in life, try this. To what extent are your actions and your decisions every day driven by short-term temporary benefits versus the long-term lasting benefits to yourself and to others? And that kind of, for the purposes of the spiritual lesson, that's the real point. <laughs> to what extent do we look to the spiritual benefits? Maybe it's kind of obvious, but let me say, the spiritual benefits, those are the really long-term benefits. And those are the only ones that matter. In a sense, anything that does not last past the end of this life does not matter at all. Apostle Paul expressed it this way, 2 Corinthians 4.18, for the things which are seen are temporary, those material things, those tangible things. But the things which are not seen, those spiritual things, they are eternal. Anything that does not last past the, la the end of this life really does not matter. And I think one of the challenges to us, one of the problems is, sometimes that distinction is not so clear. And I think the world does that to us on purpose. It tries to make us think that its ways are the best ways. Sometimes I think the people in the world try to make us think that their ways are the only ways. We need to remember that the views of those who base their success on the things of this world, their view is necessarily short-sighted. We need to remember where it is we can go for that long-term view. It's the Scriptures. The Scriptures are going to give us that long-term view based on that spiritual evaluation scheme. In fact, over this past week when I began to ponder all of this, I attribute the beginning of the sermon to the preacher who I heard so many years ago. I'm not blaming him for the rest of the sermon. A lot of this is just things I begin to think about in ways I'd never thought about them before. <laughs> And I begin to realize, I think there are places in the scriptures where they specifically and explicitly warn us about the difference between that short-term evaluation scheme and that long-term evaluation scheme. They warn us, don't confuse the short-term benefits with the much more important long-term spiritual benefits. I want to give you two examples, just two examples this morning, and they're both from the same verse. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Thinking about this in a way I never had before. Romans 12, verse 9, the first part says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Simple, read it a hundred times, more than a hundred times. But it occurred to me, you know, love can be with hypocrisy. <laughs> and that hypocritical love can be very effective in advancing us in this world. How many times in the workplace do we see someone pretending to have an attitude of love or respect or selflessness or affection for someone? Usually they're pretending that for somebody who's their supervisor. They're pretending that towards someone they think can advance their career. Now maybe you don't have that down here in Texas. But I will tell you that 18 years I worked in Washington, D.C., I've seen more than a couple of examples of that. They don't really care about the person. They're just trying to curry that person's favor because of the temporary advantage it may bring to them. Pretended affection for selfish purposes. Pretended affection for selfish purposes is not true love. It's that hypocritical love. It may work to a person's advantage in the short term in the workplace, in society, and sadly enough, even sometimes in the church. But here in Romans 12, the scriptures, the Apostle Paul lays down the principle, it's not going to work in the long term. Men may not see through the hypocrisy, so pretended love may have some short-term benefits here. Not so with God. God is not fooled. Jesus made this very pointed statement in Luke 16, 15. You are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your heart. 
for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination, an abomination in the sight of God. Hypocritical love may be a good short-term strategy. You may fool a lot of men. You may gain some temporary advantages, but that's not God's scheme. To please God, it's got to be that love without hypocrisy. That's the right long-term investment strategy. The correct long-term spiritual strategy, strategy is let love be without hypocrisy. Example number two from the same verse, the last of the verse says, Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. You know, sometimes the world looks at things through very superficial eyes. It sees, it only cares about what we do. To make a good mark with the world, many times you just have to do the things it likes and don't do the things it doesn't like. It's not good enough with God. Not only does he care about what we do externally, he cares about what we think internally. He cares about that attitude. A short, a short time, a short term success strategy might be just don't do bad stuff. But the long term strategy is abhor the things that are evil. And that's a strong word. Uh, stronger than don't do evil, he says abhor evil. Vincent says, it's a word that implies intense sentiment, loathing. Now here is a mark that is high up on the spiritual wall, actually loathing the evil. You see, in the beginning of our spiritual journey, sometimes the evil we have left behind still has some appeal to us. We may have a lingering desire. We have a lingering affection for it, a lingering desire to get close to that evil, even though we know we must not participate in it. The spiritually mature are past that. If it hurts the good God who loves us, it cannot appeal to us. We grow to hate it, to loathe it, to abhor it. We abhor it enough we don't even want to be close to it. So Paul makes an extremely important point when he says, abhor that which is evil. In the short term, we may get away with just not doing the bad stuff. But for the spiritual evaluation scheme that's going to be applied to us for eternity, attitude's important. Abhor that which is evil. And the thing next to it there, cling to what is good. And that's a lot stronger than just do good. Cling to it. Cling to what is good. As we mature spiritually, we learn to recognize what is good. We learn to recognize what is good, not in our eyes or the eyes of the world. We learn to recognize what is good in God's eyes. And we need to seek it out. And when we find it, we need to grab hold of it and not let go. We need to cling to it. And just for a statement of the obvious, these two things, the evil and the good, they're on the opposite ends of the same scale. To go toward one is to go away from the other. To run toward one is to run away from the other. You have to do both. It's a characteristic of our Lord. Hebrews 1, nine. the Hebrews writer describes our Lord as one who loved righteousness and hated, yes, hated iniquity. <clears throat> that needs to be something that's increasingly characteristic of us. Yeah, to get along in the world, maybe you just do some good things and don't do the bad things. But the long-term evaluation scheme has to do with our attitude toward those things. Abhor the things that are evil. Cling to the things that are good. Where in the scriptures anywhere is there a stronger double admonition than here in this verse in Romans? Abhor the things that are bad. Cling to the things that are good. That is the long-term strategy. So, <clears throat> Stan, why didn't you wait and preach this sermon in the middle of April right closer to tax day? Well, two things. One is I plan to be in other countries part of the time between now and then, Lord willing. But I thought, well, if it makes a point, maybe, I, maybe I, I'll, I'll give us all, and I do say us, 
one month to think about it. So over the next month, as we're finishing up those pesky income tax forms, <laughs> maybe that's an opportunity as we're reflecting on this financial near-term versus the long-term. Maybe that's a way to remember to think about the spiritual near-term versus the long-term. How much of a focus do we have on our long-term spiritual strategy? And probably a sermon or two for another time is, do we have, do we have a long-term spiritual strategy? <laughs> How much of what we do each week is for the building up of our spiritual life, working toward being prepared for eternity? Do we think of God and our relationship with him? Do we thank and praise God for the spiritual blessings that we have? As we're counting up our financial pluses and minuses, do we think about the good God who makes all things possible? Do we think about the opportunities that we have? Do we think about the opportunities that we could have if we look a little bit harder to spread the news about that good God and the kingdom of his son? This would be a good week to do that. We have a gospel. I love it when we have a gospel meeting. I can invite people to come to services without self-servingly inviting them to hear me preach. You may like that opportunity too. <laughs> you can come next Sunday and it won't be said. What we must not do, what we must not do, is let the world around us teach us to think only in the short term. We must not let it we must not let it teach us to respect a short term investment strategy to the point where we never even think about that long term spiritual investment strategy. We need to be wiser than that. One thing you can think about this morning if you're here is are you a part of the spiritual body of Christ? Are you a part of the spiritual body of the Son of God? That's I plan for that to be the topic for tonight that spiritual body of the Son of God. Are you a part of that body? If you're not, you can be. <laughs> you need to become obedient to him to become a part of his body, become a part of, of those who serve him. We must believe in God and Jesus as his son. That should change our hearts, change our heart in repentance, Luke 13, 3. Then we need to acknowledge what we believe. We need to acknowledge the thing that we appreciate and love, and that is, Jesus, that Jesus who was on the earth, born in Bethlehem, reared in Nazareth, died in Jerusalem, he was the Son of God, and he was that promised Messiah. And then the very simple act of being baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you understand these principles and have not obeyed them, do so today. Today can be your day of salvation. If there's some way we can help you, go forward to come forward. Feel free to come forward as we stand and sing. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Sadly, you'll stand if you're unprepared. Trembling, you'll fall on your knees. Facing the sentence of life or of death, what will that sentence be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be, oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Now is the time to prepare, my friend. 
Make your soul spotless and free. Washed in the blood of the crucified. <coughs> What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Please be seated. <coughs> Prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. We'll sing number 648. Love sent my Savior to die in my stead. Why should he love me so? Meekly to Calvary's cross he was led. Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should my Savior so Calvary go? Why should he love me so? Nails pierced his hand and his feet for my sin. Why should he love me so? He suffered so for my salvation to win. Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should my Savior to Calvary go? Why should he love me so? Good morning. Is there anyone who was not able to grab a communion kit on the way in? Please raise your hand. You can go ahead and peel this top plastic layer off. We'll do this together before we go into prayer to our God. It's part of our worship where we take this opportunity to honor our Father who makes all things possible. Christ's death, His accept, acceptance of Christ's death made it possible for us to stand clean in front of His sight. We honor this and we remember this by partaking of the Lord's Supper with a clear conscience and a clear mind. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for this morning for safe travels here to worship Thee. Father, we, we're thankful for your love and for your mercy, for your Son, Father, who came to this earth to die on the cross for our sins, Father, that we may have hope of eternity with thee. Father, as we partake of the bread, which represents his body, Father, we pray that we partake in a manner that's pleasing in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll go ahead and open up the second part here. And just as a reminder, when you are finished, if you could place this cup in the back of the pew in front of you, they will be picked up at the end of service. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we continue around that throne in prayer. Father, give me thanks for thy love and mercy. Father, for wanting to establish a relationship with us prior to the earth's foundation being laid. Father, we pray that 
you help us to focus on the cross, Father, that we put aside all worldly thoughts and that we remember Christ's blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. Father, as we partake of the cup, we pray that our minds are focused and that we will partake in a manner that pleases and honors Thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, it's good to see everyone this morning. We certainly invite you all back, either in person or virtually, at the new and improved 5 o'clock p.m. That sticks in my craw. At any rate, it's wonderful to meet as a body of Christians and... Uh, Thank you, Stan, for that sermon. We both know that preacher. And uh, it was so wonderful to hear. It's a story in itself, but um, uh, it's a very dear Christian brother, and I was so excited to learn about Stan's connection so many years ago. Our dear sister Vicki Dare has placed membership with us now officially, and we are so glad to have her here. Uh, please say hello, give her a, well, I was trying to say give her a hug. One of these days, um, at any rate, uh, a long distance wave, and uh, thank her for joining us, putting her roots down with us here at Shirts. Um, our brethren Farrell and Madeline DeLong, I haven't seen them for a while because of, well, everything that's going on, but uh, they request prayers for their adult son. His name is Dominic, Dominic DeLong, and the note here is he's struggling with anger issues, and that can stem from so many things, and we certainly want to keep Dominic DeLong and Farrell and Madeline in our prayers. Uh, the devil works on us in so many ways. And as parents, certainly you want to do what's right with your son and to encourage him in the right life before God. Our dear sister Kathy Woods had successful oral surgery following a fall. And... Uh, when Scott was telling us about her fall originally, it sounded like it was going to be a little bit more involved than uh, he was hoping. But oral surgery, I guess, sums it up. Uh, let's keep Kathy. She's had such a hard time of it. Keep her in our prayers. Uh, as was mentioned already, our gospel meeting is approaching, Lord willing, one week from today. Uh, Glenn Hitchcock is due to be here from the Hampton, Virginia area. And uh, the meeting itself is from Sunday through Wednesday of next week, Sunday the 21st through the 24th. And uh, more information can be obtained on our website and, of course, uh, speaking to anyone here. There's a youth night on Saturday, March 27th. And whoever wrote this has beautiful printing, but much better eyesight. Uh, 4 to 8 p.m. on Saturday the 27th, dinner will be provided. Please bring drinks. Uh, see Scott Springer for further details. Uh, so youth night on Saturday the 27th. Uh, our dear sister Betty Gaiman is 
suffering from an aggressive form of skin cancer, one place on her forehead that had been removed and has come back. Uh, hopefully by this, well, let's say by tomorrow evening, we should know more about the uh, final prognosis and where to proceed from this point. Uh, part of it will be, of course, what she wants to do, but uh, arrangements have already been made to take her to her appointment tomorrow to see about uh, future treatment options. It is possible, at least at this point, that it will involve radiation. If so, it will be over a span of several weeks, probably three times per week. This is sort of a heads up since we don't know yet. But if she does the radiation therapy, which has a very good uh, field record on, on success, we're going to need to ask for the brethren to try to take her, make sure she goes, and the people that drive her to New Braunfels for treatment would need to be in a position to go in with her. So uh, more details are available as this progresses, hopefully, once again, this is something that maybe on Wednesday night we can share more with you. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind because uh, Betty, she's been so lonely being in the old folks' home by herself. And uh, just pray that the uh, doctors have good news tomorrow about the potential for her treatment. And keep that in mind maybe if you have a motor vehicle that you can used to dedicate a day to her making that drive and being there with her. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. We'll try to let you know as soon as we can. Some other of our brethren here uh, after health scares. Uh, I'm only doing this because I'm hoping to embarrass him. Jacob Stewart is here with us today and we are so glad. I mean, he's a little bit, a little bit skinnier, but Hitting on all eight cylinders, so that's wonderful. We're worried, worried about that poor young man. Um, that's all the announcements I have here. Uh, please stay tuned. Well, no, one other thing. I do want to mention this. Uh, Brother Patton works well with our prison ministry, coordinates that, and there is some good news for anyone who knows someone who has uh, been incarcerated. Generally speaking, you may know this already, but you're not able to send cards or letters just as you might wish to an inmate. Uh, now the Postal Service, along with the feds, have come up with a new routine, and there are three times every year that you will be able to mail something directly to an inmate, and they will receive it. Uh, the dates, and they'll be posted on our website, but it's April 25th through May 9th, which is obviously coming up first, June 6th through the 20th, and December 12th through the 25th. And uh, so anyone that has uh, a loved one, a dear friend, a brethren in Christ, whatever, that would like to receive a card, you'd like to communicate with them, uh, these are dates that... Uh, that such a thing can be can be accomplished. So we'll post these, and we thank Brother Patton for providing this information. Now, if you would please be standing, we have a closing song, be led by Brother Stockton and Wayne Hendricks. Uh, Hendricks will lead us in a closing prayer. Number six hundred eighty. First and last verses. <clears throat> Often I'm hindered on my way, burden so heavy I almost fall. Then I hear Jesus sweetly says, Heaven will surely be worth it all. Heaven will surely be worth it all, worth all the sorrows that here befall, after this life with all its strife, heaven will surely be worth
earth is all, toiling and pain endure, till I shall hear the day. Jesus has promised, and I'm sure heaven will surely be worth it all. Heaven will surely be worth it all, worth all the sorrows that here befall. After this life with all its strife, Heaven will surely be worth it all. Please bow with me for our closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thank we give you thanks for so many things. Being able to to come together, uh, whether it be online or in this room today in your son's name. We give thanks for the freedom to do that openly and proudly. We thank you for the word that you've provided to us, Lord, through the Bible. We ask that that we study it, we hold each other accountable, Lord, and that we focus on eternity with every task we take every day as we learn this morning. God, for those that uh, were in the bu bulletin this morning, that need help and comfort during their struggling times. We ask that you be with them, be with their providers, be with us as we reach out to them, Lord. Help us to strengthen each other every day. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we go out throughout this week and to our next appointed time, we ask that you be with us, that you hold us strong. And it's in your Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.